Welcome to Detangle, where we untangle the complexities of life, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Kinjal Goel, and I'm very excited about today's episode. Our guest today is Dr. Milan Kirtane. If I were to introduce Dr. Kirtane formally, I would begin by telling you that he is a celebrated ENT surgeon with 50 years of experience. I would probably tell you that he was awarded the Padma Shri in 2014 the fourth highest civilian award in India. I may not list all his other awards, but I would definitely tell you about his illustrious list of publications. I would also tell you that he is the founder and president of various academic bodies in the field of ENT. But I don't want to introduce such a special guest formally. So let me tell you about the person behind the scalpel. Dr. Kirtane is one of the most passionate doctors I have known. For him, the practice of medicine is as much an art as it is a science. He is extremely fond of music and proactively pursues this hobby. He also has a green thumb and is a wildlife enthusiast. He has been at the Kenyan Safari 21 times. Welcome Dr. Kirtane. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation and for joining me on this podcast. Thank you, Kinjal. To begin with, Dr., I have a very uh, basic question in my head. Whenever we go to a neurologist or we talk to a gastroenterologist, we know that the mind plays a very important role in headaches, in gastric disturbances, and it's fairly acceptable to know that the mind and body are at play here. How do you, in your practice as an ENT surgeon, see the role of the mind when a patient walks in? I think the role of the mind is important in almost all physical ailments because whenever there is a physical ailment, it would affect the patient's psyche, his capacity to function and therefore would have certain effects on his mind. Of course, there are also other conditions where the mind has a problem and then that reflects in a a physical ailment. So, since I deal with the areas of communication, hearing, voice, speech, Right. And any disturbance in these means disturbance in communication, which is what can really have uh, severe effects on a patient's psyche. If you're not able to communicate, either by not being able to hear or not being able to speak properly, I think it would definitely upset the person quite a lot. So there is a very close relationship with these illnesses and what happens to the mind. That's fascinating because I'm sure most people have not made this connection unless they are directly affected or are caregivers. Most people won't find that the mind and ENT zones are so connected. You see a lot of dizziness, I'm sure. A lot of patients walk in and say, we've been dizzy, there is a problem with balance. And not all of these patients will have the classic BPPV. So what are the other kinds of dizziness that you see and... Are these affected by stress? Are these caused by stress or only aggravated by it? I think before we talk about the relation of stress and dizziness, I just want to tell you that as a person who treats patients with these disorders, we we need to really go into the details before we find out what the patient is actually having. The patient may be having a very vague sense of confusion in the head and he'll say, I'm dizzy. Right. When we talk about Vertigo, classically defined as a sensation of things going round and round. And it's often the case that the patient comes and sits in front of me and, you know, in that dreaded voice says, Doctor, I've got vertigo. Mm -hmm. And when you go into the details of exactly what is happening to him, it sort of boils down to the fact that he doesn't really have vertigo, but has got some kind of a, a sensation in the head, which some people might call dizziness, some people might call, I'm feeling giddy. So, it's a, it's a very nebulous kind of sensation which the patient expresses for a variety of different uh, conditions that he has. So, what I'm hearing is when a patient simply comes and says, I am dizzy, I have vertigo thanks to the internet, maybe they have put in their symptoms and the internet has thrown a word at them. But it may not always be pure dizziness or just vertigo and you need to maybe ask the right questions listen to the patient for a while and figure out exactly what kind of dizziness, if at all, is the problem. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. 
what I try to tell the patients is, look, don't use these words. Just explain to me what exactly you feel. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the room moving? Do you feel you're moving in the room? Do you see objects around you moving? And very often when they have started trying to express what exactly happens, uh, it often comes down to the fact that they're a little heavy in the head or a little confused, not feeling quite well. But they have expressed that as dizziness. So it's necessary for us to go into the details to find out in what direction our investigation should follow. Which brings me to a thought, Doctor. With your experience and with your expertise, I'm sure you see a lot of patients for second opinions, maybe third, maybe fourth opinions now. People are using uh, the availability of doctor's appointments very randomly. I always tell patients that when you go to a specialist for the first time or even a GP for the first time, Take a notepad and explain your symptoms to yourself and then go and meet the doctor so that by the time you have taken your 7th and 8th opinion, it is not contaminated by what one doctor must have thought or said. So does that happen? Do you see these patients who have more muddled thoughts because they have seen so many people in the past? All the time. (laughs) That's the price you pay for having been in practice for 50 years. Uh, Patients with... uh, dizziness, giddiness, these unspecific symptoms or even with vertigo may not always get relief when they first go to a doctor. Right. The medications are limited and uh, they therefore go from doctor to doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes a doctor might, you know, get frustrated with the patient who comes again and again not getting better and wants to push him somewhere else for a second opinion or whatever. So that's how Many of them land up with me because, yes, people know that I do have a special interest in neurotology or vertigo. I've been working on it since 50 years. But what you said about writing down the symptoms, they sometimes come with the pages and pages (laughs) written down. And they say, look, doctor, go through this. I've written this down. And I say, look, I would rather listen to it from your mouth. So you explain to me what's happening to you. And I think that is far more informative for me because then I can, you know, interject, ask a question to define what he has said rather than just reading through the paper. So I would say, yes, write down your thoughts to to know for yourself what's happening. But I think a doctor would really like to listen to your story and get some insights into which way we are heading. So, yes, very interesting. I think this also brings me to another thought. A lot of patients nowadays want to record what a doctor is saying and they want to keep it with them so that they can go back to it later and understand exactly what happened in that consultation. But not a lot of doctors are very comfortable with that. Do you get a lot of patients who come put a phone on the table or sometimes even put a phone on their laps and start recording without taking permission? Yes, they do. And I have nothing against the patient recording uh, a meeting because as they point out to your doctor, when I go back, I want to know or remember what you said, I think it would be only proper if they tell the doctor or ask the doctor, look, is it okay for me to record what we are saying because then I have the information with me. I think it's it's all fairness to the doctor that he should know that uh, the recording is... Basic etiquette, nothing more. Absolutely. I mean, no doctor would say, no, don't record anything. We are not saying anything objectionable. But... It's always nice to tell the person that, look, I'm going to record the conversation. Is it okay with you? Right. So it just makes everything crisp and clean. Lovely. Uh, Doctor, you also see a lot of patients with tinnitus, that classic ringing in the ear. It's extremely debilitating. I see a lot of patients of tinnitus and uh, they're really, really disturbed. Uh, But how do you deal with this? Does tinnitus have a real structural cause? Can it be treated simply? Or does it have a multidisciplinary approach? Tinnitus, as you said, is hearing a sound which is not present. It may be ringing, buzzing like a machine. Mm -hmm. It may be continuous or pulsatile. Sometimes they hear their own pulse. Uh, It can have a structural cause. Okay. You could have tinnitus because of an injury to the ear. Okay. You can have tinnitus because of an infection in the ear. Mm Mm-hmm. You could have tinnitus because of a tumor, say, sitting on the nerve, like an acoustic neuroma. You could have tinnitus 
because of degenerative conditions or a condition called autosclerosis where you get deposition of unhealthy bone in the ear. Mm-hmm. Now, if you have a diagnosis which can be treated, for example, if you have an acoustic nerve tumor, then you can treat the cause. If you have autosclerosis and you do surgery and you correct the patient's hearing, his tinnitus may improve, mm-hmm. although you don't remove all the disease bone. So, if you have a definite cause, infection for example, then you can treat the cause. But very often we get patients, more often than not, where after all the investigations we fail to find a cause. Okay. And here we are, you know, at a sort of crossroads, what do we tell the patient? I can't find the cause. I try to give you symptomatic treatment. The example I give them is, Look, you got a painful tooth in the middle of the night. Now, you could either go to the dentist and have the tooth taken care of, so you're treating the cause. Or if you phone up your GP in the middle of the night and says, I've got pain in the tooth, he will tell you to take symptomatic treatment to tide over by giving you a painkiller. So the painkiller is symptomatic treatment, not treating the cause. So in tinnitus, when you can't find the cause, the doctor can only give you symptomatic treatment. Unfortunately, Unlike pain, where painkillers will definitely take care of the pain, whatever the cause, there is no medication which is guaranteed to give you relief from tinnitus. Okay. So we tell the patients that we'll try different medications in in the armamentarium that we have. Maybe we'll try one line of treatment. If it doesn't, we'll try to shift to another line of treatment. But it is a refractory problem. And this is where counseling and a bit of psychotherapy would come into play. Right. So what happens, doctor, when you have a patient who has not, uh, I mean, you have not found a structural cause, so to say, for the tinnitus, and the medication is not giving as much result as you or the patient would have hoped? How does the mind then come into play in these patients? That's a question that we face all the time because Quite often, the symptomatic treatment doesn't work. The patient is getting, if I may use the word, agitated. Mm -hmm. He's anxious. He may even go into depression because it's disturbing him. Sometimes he says, I can't even sleep with it. All day long, it's with me. And this is where we would have to sit down, counsel him, explain to him the nature of the problem, reassure him that since we've done all the investigations and ruled out any physical causes, there is no harm that's going to come to him with because of the tinnitus. Because some of them are worried that it will affect their mind and hmm. you know their capacity, their memory, etc. That's not going to happen. And uh, two things. We, we tell them about masking the tinnitus. Okay. So having a sound around. You actually can buy a tinnitus masker which gives a white noise. But you could just as well have a sound which you can sit with or sleep with without any problem. A little noisy air conditioner, a fan, even soft music which can mask the sound which is being generated from inside the patient's ear. Okay. We also tell them to, you know, what is called as tinnitus reorientation therapy, which in short means change your attitude to the tinnitus. Don't go after it. Don't focus on it and learn to put it into the background. Mm -hmm. But in spite of this, if the patients are still not uh, coming out of their depression, anxiety, agitation, then I would certainly seek the help of a psychiatric colleague, I would have to refer the patient to a a psychiatrist because believe me, some of them can be so disturbed that they even mention that, you know, I might want to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to take that lightly. These are patients whose anxiety levels or depression levels are so high that it is better that they get psychiatric help. So yes, it is disturbing, it is debilitating and it is Something which is constantly present, I think, for some people, which is why it gets so difficult. But I'm glad there are other disciplines which get involved and try to help the patient in the best way possible. Moving on, doctor. I know you have been extremely passionate about helping people with hearing loss. Um, I know you have worked extensively in the field of hearing aids and cochlear implants. I want to talk to you about the stigma which we as a society have created, maybe unknowingly, but which most patients face when it comes down to using a hearing aid. 
so can you tell me your experience with it who comes to you do they accept hearing aids easily and how do you go about it yes it does exist this uh, if i may use the word stigma of hearing aid i mean let me not use that strong word but people don't want to wear a hearing aid they don't mind wearing glasses they don't mind dentures they mm. don't mind walking with a stick if the leg is hurt right but no hearing aid and i was just thinking about this the origin of this or what could have caused this and i think uh, i could give you an explanation blindness and deafness both are handicaps you had helen keller who was both right and when i think uh, asked about the two handicaps she said that deafness is far worse than blindness because blindness sort of isolates you from things deafness isolates you from people communication right. communication now what has happened in general i don't know what is the reason for this but it goes back a long way the blind get a lot of sympathy which is quite okay but the deaf often get ridiculed hmm you will see so many jokes you can see in the movies you know jokes being made because the person is deaf is made fun of mm-hmm. nobody ever does that to a blind person so i think this psych has come down into society and that you would be ridiculed if you're wearing a hearing aid this is i think from where the whole i mean i had a patient uh, who was almost 85 years old and when i told him you need a hearing aid he says no talk anything you can do surgery but no hearing aid i said why he says it will make me look old he was 85 right okay. but for a person if he realizes that if he cannot hear and cannot communicate he is going to isolate himself he is going to segregate you know sort of not meet up with people because he can't communicate and that can lead to depression and i think dementia would set up sort of set in more early if you isolate yourself and don't communicate so therefore i feel very strongly that we have to try and remove this stigma and, you know i thought I, if i give this example they'll be convinced but it's somehow that doesn't work i said look tomorrow if your best friend appeared before you wearing a hearing aid would your attitude to your friend change in any way said, no of course not so if your attitude is not going to change to a person wearing a hearing aid why do you feel that other people will look at you differently if you wear a hearing aid but somehow the other i thought this would be a convincing argument but it is not and i feel is one of my audiologist colleagues said we have to blame the hearing aid companies also because they've gone and made hearing aids which are invisible right why don't they make them more colorful instead so you are giving a message that you shouldn't be seen with a hearing aid right. and it's you you use it but hide it hmm. and i think that adds to the feeling that oh i don't want to be seen with a hearing correct. aid correct so all spectacles are now coming in different frames and styles yeah so it's no longer spectacles it's i wear right it's i wear <laughs> it's i wear it's fashion i mean i know of people who wear glasses in spite of not having a number just to look more fashionable hmm. so i think that has gone for wearing glasses nobody minds you have school children in the second and third standard with glasses or nobody gives them a second look but i think if we can in some way remove this stigma it will be a great thing because a lot of people are suffering isolation which could be avoided if they were willing to use hearing aids especially children now that you mention it i'm sure like children need spectacles children need hearing aids if it comes down to it but most parents would try and avoid it as much as possible so that their child is not ridiculed or uh, that's excluded. their fear that's, that's their, their fear, fear. Yeah. right i even remember there was a child uh, you had told me about who whose parent had asked for special permission in school so that she could leave her hair open to hide her hearing aid now that literally hits the nail on the head that no matter what hiding it was important where we need to take it out the root cause of you know this whole taboo or this feeling of being different needs to be eradicated any idea what we as uh, as society can do to help people who need hearing aids and to remove this feeling of being different 
I, I really don't know. Maybe I thought of it sometime like for other causes, you have celebrities taking it up. Right. So if you had a celebrity who's very popular with the masses, mm-hmm. coming on screen on the television with a with a hearing aid and saying how happy is with the hearing aid, how mm-hmm. cool it is to wear a hearing aid, it might do the trick. But, um, you know, it's very surprising. I also do cochlear implants. Okay. And we integrate these cochlear implant children after three or four years into normal schools. Mm-hmm. And they have not faced uh, any stigma. Any stigma. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of them have done so well. One of our girls was voted as the most popular girl in school. Mm. She stood first in the 12th standard exam. Uh, three of my cochlear implantees have gone into medical school. And they are accepted by the other students, uh, you know, just like normal people. So, where are we? Are we missing something? Why are not hearing aids then? So, just for the sake of clarity for the audience, which is mostly lay people right now, how is a cochlear implant different from a hearing aid? Who needs which one? Can you just give us a little bit of insight into that? Okay. Um, hearing aids are meant for people whose inner ear. Usually it's meant for the inner ear. Of course, you can also give it for conductive losses in certain cases. Mm-hmm. But mostly it is the inner ear deafness which cannot be surgically corrected. Okay. Where the person needs either the other people to talk loudly so that they can be heard. Mm-hmm. The hearing aid is nothing but an amplifier. Okay. It's a loudspeaker. So instead of the person talking loudly to a deaf person, the person speaks normally, the hearing aid picks up the sound, amplifies it. It's an amplifier. Right. And feeds a louder sound to the inner ear, that's the cochlea. And the nerve cells in the cochlea convert this sound into electrical signals and send it along the nerve to the brain. That's how we hear and understand what's being said. Right. Now, the hearing aid will work as long as the cochlea has some life left in it. I mean, the only analogy I can give is if you have a weak connection in your telephone. Mm -hmm. In the olden days when we used to make trunk calls, we had to shout, hello, hello, can you hear me? And, you know, because the connection was weak. Mm -hmm. So we had to give a, a louder input for the other person to hear. But if the phone is dead, you can shout all you want. And nothing is happening. So, when the cochlea or the inner ear loses its capacity to convert sound energy into electrical signals. So, just amplification of the sound is not going to help. It's not going to work. That's where a cochlear implant comes in. And a cochlear implant basically has two parts. So, it's not a a sophisticated hearing aid. It comes into play where hearing aids are no longer useful. Okay. And the main, the heart of the cochlear implant is a small computer that looks like a hearing aid, but is actually a computer, Mm -hmm. which is worn on the ear like a hearing aid. The microphone picks up the sound and instead of sending the sound to the ear, sends it to the computer. Mm -hmm. The computer does what the cochlea was supposed to do, that is convert this sound into electrical signals. But these electrical signals are outside the body. You need to put them to the nerve. So, like you have a receiver in your house, a TV or a radio and an antenna on the roof, we put a receiver into the patient's ear, which goes around the cochlear nerve, because that's where the information has to go. And under the skin, we have an antenna with a little magnet in the center. The skin is closed, nothing is seen outside. When the patient puts the outside computer on his ear, there is a small transmitting coil with also an opposite pole magnet in the center. Okay. which fits onto the antenna and across the skin using radio frequency as a carrier, this electrical information which is in the computer now behind the ear is sent to the nerve and from the nerve to the brain. So the inner ear function which is lost is replicated by a computer and then fed to the nerve. This is fascinating. It's, 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 a, it's a miracle of modern electronic Technology. Truly. And I'm glad that now technology has reached a point where a lot more people are being helped. A lot more people are trained in helping in the correct way. Absolutely. Because, you know, I have myself over the last 26, 27 years done or mentored about 4,000 cochlear implants. And many of these children are 
having education in normal schools, colleges, doing jobs, medical college, I told you. It's funny that in India, for example, 95% of our cochlear implantees are children because they get donations. It's an expensive thing. It's mm-hmm. Six lakhs is the minimum cost of the implant itself. Although cochlear implants was initially devised only for adults. Oh. People thought it may not work in deaf children who are born deaf because they don't have language. Adults who were hearing normally and then became deaf have language and speech. So it was really meant for them. So in any developed country, you have an equal number of adults and children operated. But because of the cost and no donations are available for adults, but only for children. In all the centers in India, about 95% operated patients are children because the funding is available. But there is a huge number of adults out there. Who still need it. Who are not happy with their hearing aids. Who say the hearing aid doesn't give me much. I don't want to wear it because... It's not the stigma. I just don't want to wear it because it's not helping me. These are candidates for cochlear implants. And believe me, I've had a lot of patients. I've got doctors who went back into practice. I have you know, people who were running companies, conducting board meetings, who had to stop because they couldn't hear with hearing aids, have gone back to their jobs. Mm-hmm. So it's a whole population there waiting to be helped. And I think uh, if this information can reach them, a lot of them can take the benefit of this miracle of modern electronic technology, the cochlear implant. It is truly fascinating. I mean, when you talk about hearing aids and how how we just look down upon them for no real reason, there is no valid reason that you or me can come up with on why every other physical aid is accepted. I mean, yes, we have silver walking sticks. So like I wear, people use walking sticks with Elan. But with hearing aids, all we are trying to do is hide them and hide them better. So yes, even I have seen a couple of hearing aids which are so thin and they are marketed as invisible hearing aids. So that's supposed to be the USP. I think it's time to change the narrative. And I think when people like yourself are so vocal about it, if the right amount of people hear it, you'll probably reach the tipping point and the narrative will shift. Hopefully some celebrities will come up I don't know uh, if anyone is already interested in the cause, but I'm sure the change will come eventually. Well, before we wrap up, I want to say a big, big thank you, doctor. This has been a real eye opener. Your insights and your addressing this stigma on hearing aid has taught me a lot. I knew a little bit, but I knew that there was still a lot more for me to ask and a lot more for me to learn. Thank you for your dedication to this cause. Not a lot of people nowadays will dedicate their lifetime to something and have such a treasure trove by the time they are the seniors in their field. So thank you for everything that you do for society. Thank you for being the person you are. And thank you personally for being with me today and for recording this podcast. I'm sure we'll take Detangle to as many people as we can and spread this information in the most organic way possible. Thank you, Kinjal. It's been a pleasure interacting.